everybody. Welcome to Rock and Roll episode, Rock and Roll Shinsu 2, episode number 102. How's it going? It's been a while. My name is Gabe Essel. I'm here with my co-hosts, Dennis Levi Leach and Jonathan Getz. How are you guys? Ah, reporting for duty. Bonjour, good, bonjour. good. I know. After a hiatus. Um, I think like the playoffs have barely started when, um, when, when we recorded our last episode, and now we're in the throes of the winter meetings. <laughs> so. I, I, I predict the Nationals uh, will win the World Series. And, uh, <laughs> it will re-sign Steven Strasburg and yes. Yes. let Anthony Rendon go to the Angels. <laughs> wow, it's crystal ball that you have, Jonathan. Um, but anyway, it's good to it's good to be back, and I do mean that with um, with all sincerity, guys. It's nice to hear your voices again, and it's nice to be. Um, on the chew again i hope everybody's been good and um tonight we're gonna keep rolling with um our 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 our, this list of gratitude that we've uh that we started god months ago um but now that we're in the holiday season uh, the list of gratitude is is more appropriate i like that name for it absolutely um and uh Let's let, let's just we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here in, in, in just a second. Uh, I want to remind everybody, though, I guess, a little bit about the the episode format. Um, two episodes ago, we started this this list of 100 things about baseball and music that were that we appreciate that we're grateful for. Right. Um, and we've we've uh, we've we've been plowing through those for for a couple episodes and just um had some schedule hangups, etc., and now we are ready to to keep rocking with this. Got a nice diverse array of topics, I think, um, that'll be fun to share. So, um, and if you've got any as well out there, just uh, feel free to let us know, and uh, we can we can uh, we can talk about those two uh, online. Want to remind everybody though, before we begin, you can find every episode of Rock and Roll Shinsu Chu at rockchew.com. You can also find us on Instagram and the Twitter at Rock in Chew, and please like us on Facebook as well. All right, I'll go ahead and start here with um, my number. Well, I guess it's twenty-five. Uh, seventy-six overall, I think. Yeah, seventy-six overall. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there are two bands um, that have merged. Gosh, now they're they're certainly veteran acts within uh, the last thirty years. Um, that are mystifyingly popular to me. And I like both of these bands a lot, Um, particularly Radiohead, which is one of the bands, and then the other band being Tool. Um, Guys, I'm hard-pressed to find two other popular bands that fill arenas consistently that um, kind of also... To a certain degree, it's it's kind of a big deal when they release a record, particularly in Tool's case, because there was about a 13-year gap in between albums. Um, and uh, I, I can't think of any other bands that are this popular but make somewhat inaccessible music, at least to kind of your, I don't know, your sort of... Your, your kind of mainstream, quote unquote, uh, rock and roll crowd. And they don't really have um, a collection of popular singles behind them. All the singles that they had happened at the beginning of their careers, really on their first records, all the b- singles that that were, you know, kind of MTV staples. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that, you know, I think two bands that are that make smart, challenging music um, have maintained their popularity for this long and maybe even grown it, I would say, in Tool's case. Right. So, I, I, I would say they've done a really good job, both of them, at marketing marketing the hype of, of each of the bands. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, they've been able to create create demand almost mm-hmm. scarcity by, yeah by, yeah. by, by withholding product <laughs> yeah right I mean, right it, it's like really it's like simple marketing basically but yeah like, yeah so maybe it's not that maybe mystifying is the wrong word but um it's i would say for the music that they make though you know i mean like um like you know, tools got more in common with King Crimson than they've got in common with Metallica. You know what I mean? Right. 
Um, the fact that, you know, like, God, they're like every, every, pretty much every arena show selling out for both of these bands are pretty close. Um, when they're, and again, like Levi said, I, I, I think there is some scarcity and there's, 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 there's kind of marketing there in the sense that, um, there's always been kind of like a, a little bit of like mystery or an aura surrounding both of those bands too, you know, Tool and Radiohead. I would um, say it's, it's like marketing through lack of marketing. Through my lack, right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, I I guess the reason I included it on the list, and then we can move on, um, is uh, I, 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 I like it. I'm appreciative of, like, that, like, smart stuff really broke through. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like how you scratch your head, like, even though I wasn't around really in much of the 70s, um, it's really cool that Emerson, Lake, and Palmer was so popular. You know what I mean? Like, well, uh, it's, it's, it's like that. Of, yeah, like, I, my thing was, what's so funny is these two bands are two bands that I've, like, never been able to totally get into. Sure. But, like, I love 70s progressive. Like, I really like the King Crimson records with uh, Adrian Ballou. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I like Nectar. I like Yes. But, like, I try to... I don't know. When I listen to Tool, it's like I'm listening to Algebra. And then, <laughs> like, Radiohead, I think, was... I could never pin them down enough. Yeah. Like, they changed their sound so much every time I would try to get into them <laughs> that it would it would turn me off because I would be like, well, this doesn't sound like the last thing I kind of heard, but like, I don't know. Not that that's bad. It was just like you said, they're not, they're not the easiest bands for people to become accessible, you know, to access. Right. Gabe, Gabe, do you think that they would have the current success that they do? And by success, I mean, filling arenas, Mm -hmm. if they didn't have those early radio hits. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, you know the the, the <coughs> early the early exposure probably played a role. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess you can't. It's, it's, I, I it's not know. a fair question because it's yeah. inevitably part of the equation of everything. Um, because you know they're the music and the music is yeah. them and all that and yeah and 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 you know they would still be making all of the music that they did it's just yeah. a matter of you know if if they didn't get that break with you know a, a fascinating video like the tool video was i think got a lot of spin yeah um, sure uh be, be, because it was a really creative video mm-hmm. um and then the, the radiohead song because it was you know it was like this slacker anthem or whatever you want to call it and, right and um uh i i i, I I wonder if that just like had enough, it created enough of a base audience that they would never go away, yeah. and, you know, with subsequent albums. And, and yeah, sure, you're going to have your more fair weather fans. And by fair weather, I mean more the, the radio hit fans um, uh, who will drop off along the way. But uh, it, it, it's still unbelievable that they are able to fill these arenas, even with those radio hits from 30 years ago. Right, um, right, 25 years ago. Yeah, yeah which 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 neither of them are really want to play now either. You know? Oh no, yeah, you won't yeah. hear them. Yeah. yeah, at all. Yeah. Um, speaking of, I, I was if you go to Setlist FM, um, you'll the Tool Setlists are always like the most viewed Setlists, whatever whatever uh, their most recent show was. Yeah. And um, Setlist FM has a top ten of the most popular Setlists being viewed, and it. Four or five of them are usually tool set lists when they're on tour. And I looked at the set list, and they're like the same sets every yeah, night. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird that like I don't, I don't know what I don't know what everybody's expecting there. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was kind of like my um, maybe it's like the the nineteen ninety nine like Gay Bestel of like you should change your set. You should be like widespread panic, man. Change your songs every night. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's I've always thought of Tool, and I've always seen them in concert once. Actually, it was with Levi when at Bonnaroo. Right. Um, uh, I always thought that was kind of lame, you know, that they played the same songs every night on a tour. Um, but we, we should yeah. use the term seeing them very lightly because we, we saw their shadows behind some sheets that were hung. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, it was, it was, they it was very, it was a very artistic performance. Yeah. Like the Maynard, like hid behind a speaker and stuff, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was like, weird. you just saw like the silhouette of like a drummer and a drum set and like a guitarist. And, right. Like, 
Right. But yeah, you know, hey, the tunes the tunes hold up to me. You know, I think the I think the there's I think both bands are still putting out really solid work. Absolutely. Uh, that uh and I, I think the new tool record's great, uh, particularly Danny Barnes, the drummer. Uh, his playing is fucking awesome. Um, some of the best he's ever played. So, and yeah, and Radiohead too, you know. Um, uh, it, still, you know, Moonshape Pool was was great. I mean, yeah, yeah, they're um, and they're they're both they're both still making really interesting music too. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and and I think that. Uh, on a certain level, I, th- I think that they excel at making really, still really high end, uh, crafting high end songs, unlike a lot of their peers from uh, that started around the same time that that are still well respected. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of care that goes into their records. It seems like mm-hmm. you know, with with both of those bands, um, they really they know how to make the studio work well for them both of those both mm-hmm. of those bands um so yeah so hey there you go there's mine very That's nice good. very nice um next i think i'm gonna highlight one of the things that i loved about baseball and particularly in the mid and late 80s was how teams would like adopt theme songs for usually for like a season at a time mm-hmm. like i, I I remember the Cubs one year. It was Jump Van Halen. They would play like the clip of it at the beginning of like every Cubs game. You know, it was part of the like WGN logo promo before every game. And then I also remember um, the Cardinals would play The Heat Is On. Like we would, they would play that a lot before Uh Cardinals games. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so like, I think they need to bring this back. Like, I think teams need to, like... What's funny is that you don't see it in baseball, but, like, what? The Blues just won in hockey, the Stanley Cup, and their their big, like, team song was the... Uh, oh, it was the classic 80s song. Uh, not oh, Val- Gloria. Gloria, yeah. I was going to say yeah. Valerie. Oh, like, <laughs> was, Gloria, Gloria. Gloria, that one? Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that, that became right. their theme song. No but like I, I just I don't know. I think it's quirky. I think it's neat. I think yeah. it gives teams character. What's that? I, what's that Blackhawks one that they sing after every goal um, uh, the, during their cup run? Was it uh, the the da 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 That's a catchy one. I like that one. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the name, but yes. Do you yeah. guys do you remember that at all? Like, Not at all. I mean, specific. No. <laughs> okay. I uh, yeah I. I mean, I guess it, it's it still happens to a certain degree. Like Levi was just some of the examples. Like the White Sox, in like 2005, did "Don't Stop Believing," you know, which <laughs> now which now seems like a totally lame choice. Um, the Giants but, you know, they, did it too, right? Didn't they co-opt? Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Like because yeah. Steve Perry like came to the White Sox yeah. rally and stuff. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was weird. And then he came to the Giants rallies. I exactly. Think he's, a front he's yeah, and he's he's from yeah, he's from the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, um, yeah. So it, it it works sometimes, you know. Yeah, I I I can, I can get behind it. Um, of course, the, the the Red Sox they they sing "Dirty Water", Water at sure. every song yeah. or every every win. I should at, at Fenway, right? Um, uh, but yeah, Levi, those specifically, I I don't I don't, uh, I don't remember those. Um, so would they play them on the broadcast? Would you hear them on the broadcast? Yeah, I uh, the Cubs one specifically, they would play it like right before, you know, like they would have a graphics package, you know, like coming up WGM baseball, you know, and it would be like, they would start playing might as well jump. And it was like these clips of like, you know, Sandberg turning a double play. And like they, it would, they would like it would, because that this also tied in, I guess this could be like a, a number 75, a attachment to this, whatever. <laughs> but like, do you remember that was the thing? It was like, oh my god, we can edit sport clips to popular rock songs. It was like <laughs> this huge thing. Like, it you know, it started with like Walk of Life. That video had like you know sports clips and bloopers set to Dire Straits. And so then I remember watching like VHS tapes that they would make specifically of just like bloopers and sports highlights 
set to like rock music. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I wonder. I wonder how often they actually got permission for doing things <laughs> like that, or, right? or if royalties were paid out. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> Nowadays, it might just be more complicated to be able to execute <laughs> something like that, and can't quite grow organically. Right. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, well, I'll move on then to mine. Uh, uh, so uh, mine is uh, uh, K- the Kadeko. Is it? Kadeko, Kadeko, uh, All Star Baseball, uh, and uh, specifically the travel edition of uh, Kadeko All Star Baseball. And uh, so this All Star Baseball game uh, consisted of uh, it was a, it was a board game, right? And you know, they, they came with these discs and a spinner. And the discs, each disc represented a player. The player's mug was on there, except that their hat, it was only MLB PA endorsed. It wasn't MLB endorsed, so it was a blank hat, the dreaded blank hat. Um, so like Keith Hernandez, just in like a Navy cap. And uh, and then uh, around the perimeter uh, of the, the, the disc uh, were uh, certain numbers at varying widths. And so if he had like a... a you know, the number one and it would would be like an inch long uh, and it, that would stand for, say, a single and a number two would be a little bit smaller. That would be a double. Then maybe a number seven would be a strikeout. And that would be like really big because they were prone to striking out. So the the the, the widths of of um, these occurrences uh, pertained to their stats on an annual basis. They would redo the discs every year, I believe. Uh, and. Oh. Uh, so you would put it in the spinner, you'd spin it, and you know you just do what whatever it says to do, and you know you would have you would then keep score uh, in a scorebook, and mm-hmm. um, uh, and so it was. I, I took this along with me. It was uh, th- this game had a very short lived era in my life. I was around eight <laughs> or nine, and, um, and 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 I and I took this along with me to the Ozarks. Um, uh, with it was a family vacation, and I'm not much of a yeah. nature guy, but this was my indoor refuge. This was my excuse to stay in the cabin and play <laughs> play this game. I got game. a hot game yeah. of Kadeko going, yeah. Mom. I can be outside. <laughs> it's it's the it's the bottom of the seventh, you know. And I got Mattingly up at the plate here, and uh, <laughs> and and so it was it was kind of like along with video games that you know vi- that would eventually replace this you know i couldn't take my n- eight bit nintendo and play baseball in the ozarks so um it, you know and it's romantic to romantic to kind of think back and remember just getting so wrapped up in just this one thing that it consumed your attention for yeah. an hour or two or however long it played the, the game and you were just laser focused on it and uh, and, and yeah, you would, I mean, you would keep score through the whole thing and, you know, you would finish and be like, man, that was, that was like a two hours well spent, you know, <laughs> I, I really accomplished something here. And, um, and it was very simple and, uh, I just might have to go find that very edition and, and, and purchase it for, for myself as a little, uh, like I totally had forgotten about this until I saw it on your list and I looked it up and saw yeah. what it was. Yeah. I remember having a friend or two that had this. It, it seemed like it was marketed to kids who are maybe going to be like bookkeepers or accountants someday. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> it was, or, or it was like marketed, it was like Dungeons and Dragons for kids that usually beat up kids who play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this didn't have that much strategy to it. I mean, it was, mm. you're just you're just flipping a, a, a yeah the spinner yeah. Uh, so like going D and D is probably giving it too much credit um <laughs> it's a little more involved in D and D yeah the spinner man you you can you can get you can get good on the spinner sure yeah oh yeah yeah I won't lie I mean sometimes you just kind of like nudge it a little bit to get what you need to get that clutch yeah, clutch this is double Vegas. that guy's watching up in the pit yeah. <laughs> Yep. So, so there you go. Kadeco All Star Baseball. Nice. Good. 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 Good choice. Um, I'll. Uh, I got the next one here, and this is something that like is starting to change, but I kind of I want to see more of it. Um, you know, Jessica Mendoza. I don't know if you guys. You know, she is a, a broadcaster at ESPN. Um, it's, it's pretty cool to hear a woman in the booth, you know, 
Mm-hmm. And um, and I, I think she does a, a, a I think she does a really good job. And um, you know she yeah she's got good insights. And I, I'm just glad to to start to see baseball kind of open up a little bit more. And granted, they've got a long way to go, but it's. I don't know. Maybe maybe the baseball 50 years from now will not be like such a dude's club, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there are like some women that are um, have high ranking um, front office positions, you know, like the assistant GM for the Yankees is is uh, Gene Afterman. Um, and then the um, I think for the Dodgers as well. Yeah, uh, there's like a senior like you know, she's one of the main people for the Red Sox as well. Like she's a senior vice president. I forgot her name at the moment, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that all of this, like, I think probably within the next, maybe even less than the next fewer than the next 10 years, excuse me. Um, I think we'll see our first like female general manager. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. So, I hope so. And, and, yeah, and, so and her and Mendoza specifically, her name was being floated out there for the Mets managerial position, which would have been uh, awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, that would have been so cool. Yeah, because I believe she is a consultant for the Mets, isn't she? As well. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I know she's got ties to I am yeah. pretty sure she's got ties to him. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if she can broadcast Mets games, but um yeah. I've never never heard her um at the booth for a Mets game. But uh yeah. So it's 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 good to see. I think she's really good and um I don't know, so I hope it I hope I hope it continues. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting if if uh, you know if she gets a job first like that, or if the assistant for the San Antonio Spurs, um, uh, who's oh, seen yeah. as kind of the heir apparent to uh, to Popovich, um, to Popovich, yeah, yeah. yeah um, could be the first uh, major sport uh, manager slash coach, right, right, f- female manager slash coach. Yeah, I mean, it, it would, it's, it's it, with I, for, I forgot about the um, for the Spurs, like it's. Obviously, like a Popovich, I, I, I'm a big Popovich fan. He's, sure. he's, a, he's, yeah. a, he's a cool, I mean, like I, my 2020 ticket, I want to be Popovich and Kerr. You know what I mean? <laughs> Basically, that should be, if the Democratic Party's listening, that's who they should get, right? Those two right there. Pops Popovich and Kerr. and Kerr, you're done. Yeah, win, win, I'm in. Um, but, but, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, we're getting close. Let's just put it that way. Getting close. Yeah. 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 You're right. It's, it's good progress. And, and two, I mean, sometimes the, the, the energy in, in, in a play by play booth in a broadcast booth can be uh, really grating at times yeah, uh, yeah, and exhausting, but that that's actually a good team. I don't even think they need a rod in that booth on Sunday night baseball. No. Um, uh, between the play by play guy, John, John Shambi is it? John Shambi. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. And, and her, I think they're awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it's uh, ESPN does a good job with baseball. You know, I'm I'm yeah. I'm kind of lukewarm to most other things ESPN does, other than thirty for thirties. But um, yeah. they've always done. I think Levi mentioned it in a previous episode as well. The Sunday night baseball is always filmed really well too. Mm-hmm. You know, the camera yeah, works well really good. Yeah. yeah, it's well produced. Um, so so yeah, yeah, they they always do a good job. So it's mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. So good one. Fun. Yeah, thank you. Very nice. Um. Next, I'm going to touch on something uh, for mine that pretty much everyone, I think, of our generation took took advantage of at one point, and that's Columbia House and BMG. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. And whether whether you scammed them or whether you were legit, you know, you were probably on one of these companies' mailing lists in the 1990s, and uh. I, I have them to think. I can't remember if it was BMG or Columbia House, but that was how I acquired. Like right when Jerry Garcia died, I was <laughs> like, "Oh, I'm going head in, you know, diving into the Grateful Dead," and I got like 14 Grateful Dead CDs for one of them. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm trying to remember. I think it was like you know you got so many CDs for free, but then you had to buy three at like regular price, which was like thirty dollars a CD. <laughs> yes. so you ended up right. with like twelve or thirteen CDs for like ninety something dollars, <laughs> which is, I mean, which is still a decent deal, I yeah, guess. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, you know, as as a kid, you're trying to work it, and I, I know people that like gave them wrong addresses and wrong names and. 
you know, there, there are people that probably still owe Columbia House and BMG money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I do you guys do you yeah. you were you uh, clients of either of these? Yeah. I, I Rep- looked at it admirably, but I never signed up, man. Yeah, really? I had I, yeah, like um, other folks I knew did, but yeah, I, uh, I I don't know. I don't know if my mom like didn't trust it or something like that. Yeah, was, <laughs> she was probably calling the shots there. Yeah, like a lot of people don't. It, it was CD. It was like. Uh, it was like subsidized music, basically. Right. Because mm-hmm. Columbia House and BMG was getting all these CDs and discounts from the record companies and everything. And so that's how they could do it. But, yeah, I mean, there's a, you know, anytime you're you're taping a quarter to a postcard and mailing it away, you're like, I wonder the legitimacy of this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I never really questioned the legitimacy legitimacy of it, and I and I did partake in Columbia House specifically. I got um, it, it. Really helped uh, build my collection uh, right. from a very broad base. It was it was Aerosmith's greatest hits. It was Skinner's Zennards. It was Allman Brothers' greatest hits. And then like, and then Nevermind and Green Day's Dookie, um, uh, which is probably the only one I no, I wouldn't say it's the only one I know. So Nevermind might be the only one I still have out of all of these. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was a good base to get a collection going. Um, yeah. But it, it, there was there was a sneaky fun byproduct of it, and that was the catalog. To sit down and yeah. just browse the catalog was something you couldn't really yeah. do at that time. You couldn't just browse music unless you went to the record store, right. and it offered you that. And did it was it like little stamps, or am I miss? Am I oh, totally uh, off on that? On some of on some of the advertisements and magazines and stuff, yes, you would have. They would have the little titles of each record on a stamp, and you'd have to like peel them and lick them. And yes, stuff. you'd be oh, like, yes, "These are the thirteen albums I want." Oh, yeah. wow, I forgot that. Dude, guys, I'm looking online, dude. Columbia House still does, like, a DVD thing. Nice. Wow. Nice. But, like, the music part just went out of business here. I'm looking at an article on Stereo Gum in 2015. Wow. How did they keep it going that long, dude? I haven't <laughs> yeah. read this article, so that might have something to do with it. But There, um, there are people who are really, really still into CDs. I mean, when I worked in the shop at Recycled Records, this would have been in the mid 2000s. There were a couple CD collector guys that would come in there each week and order probably 10 or 15 new CDs. And sometimes we would have the CDs used and they would look brand new. And these people were like, no, I want them sealed. And hmm. like, like they were, yeah. And so. As crazy as it sounds, I mean, there were people right until the end, uh, you know what I mean? There are still people that collect CDs, you know, and but it's it's not obviously what it used to be. I I think that they could they could go back to the cassette business model with all these hipsters eating up cassettes nowadays. Right. Uh, And and, and, and offer offer up 12 cassettes for a quarter. I would say there's like there's got to be a vinyl equivalent now. Right. Uh, there's a lot of yes. vinyl subscription services yeah. where you pay so yeah. much a month and they kind of send you like a grab box of vinyl. Okay. Um, I just saw a statistic to where vinyl ha- is now outpaced CDs in sales for the first time since like 1986. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, it was straight up. It was yeah, yeah, straight dollars for dollars. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, yeah, it's surprising that it lasted until 2015, no doubt. Yeah. I don't know how I'll have to read up, uh, read up on the articles, but yeah, it, uh, but you can still do the v- DVDs that they're like, uh, like t- two of them for 10 bucks, you know, for something <laughs> like that. Oh, really? Yeah. So, <laughs> oh man, get, get grown ups one and two. All right. <laughs> 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 uh, nice nice all right so uh moving on um my uh next item is um it's about a moment in a concert and uh b- 
but not just that, and it, but it's it's relatable. I, th- I, th- I think you guys will relate to it. And uh, specifically for me, it's uh, one of my favorite bands, The National, uh, performing uh, one of their songs, one of their better known songs called Graceless at the Starlight Theater uh, in Kansas City uh, last uh, October 2018. So a little over a year ago. And um, it's just an example of like a particularly exciting moment that will occur at a concert and it just kind of envelops you and overtakes you and you forget about the all the other things that are annoying you around you like people looking at their phones or right like, yeah yeah you know and um and so you just you, you have an opportunity to kind of lose yourself in in all the music and and um and and so this was enabled by the fact that uh, matt berninger the, the lead singer of the national kind of has this shtick that a lot of musicians have um where once a show he'll take the microphone um on like a thousand foot cable why he doesn't have a wireless microphone i don't know um uh but and he'll and he'll just walk out into the crowd and this is a amphitheater and he's going you know he, he's going ha- halfway up the bowl with with his microphone and and he's singing like the 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 favorite part of one of my favorite songs um in the next section over and he anybody's like in the same row in the next section singing to everybody around him and um and and just to like feel that energy um both there and, and on the stage and yet at the same time stay focused that you aren't like just you know taking your phone out to film it <laughs> and instead you're 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 you know, just appreciating the moment for what it is. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's, like I said, he, he does it, I think every show and, but for me, it's something that never gets old and it, it definitely adds a, another level of intensity, uh, to a concert. It might be in the middle of the concert or at the end. And, uh, you know, it makes for a pretty unforgettable experience. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I kind of had an experience like that one time at an Aerosmith show. Um, we had gotten lawn tickets, and it was one of the times they were playing Riverport in St. Louis. And before the show, we noticed, like, in the middle of the lawn was, like, this, like, platform and a riser with, like, you know, concert fencing around it. Just the metal, you know, r- wrought iron type fencing. And um, we didn't really think much about it. And so... Like halfway into the middle of their set, Aerosmith's playing. They got probably a hundred security people to like chain arms on both sides, and they created like like they parted the sea. And Aerosmith went from the main stage there at Riverport out onto this little platform in the lawn and played about four or five songs. <laughs> And, like, they had set up, like, you know, in the meantime, we hadn't even paid attention, but they had set up, like, a little drum kit and, like, sure. mm-hmm. had some instruments all of a sudden on there. And so, yeah, it was, like, all of a sudden we turned and, like, Aerosmith was, like, right next to us. Wow. Yeah. And so, yeah, to to be able to to be that close to him, especially when you figure, you know, you're only going to see him from the lawn all night, you know, look up at the little jumbo tron yeah. once in a while. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've had, I've had, I've been like that. I've had unexpectedly good seats before, you know, like like in that regard. Like, cause like Levi said, the Stones also do like a on their last few tours, at least, and both times I've seen them, um, they've always done like two or three numbers on a small stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and when the first time I saw them in '02 was in Detroit, um, I actually had pretty decent seats. I mean, it was. Obviously, it's the football stadium, um, so it's huge. Uh, and I was, but I was on the first. I was in the lower bowl, pretty much center. And then when they came out for that, you know, I it was it was like a good seat at that point. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, yeah. I don't I I don't remember how necessarily close, but I mean, I was, I don't know, I was probably it's probably thirty yards from them. You know, at that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was that was cool, and it was just it was just them and Chuck Lavelle, so they kind of stripped it down a little bit. You know, they didn't. You know, there weren't as there was it wasn't there was as much going on. You know, they kind of 
Um, and I know it's kind of it's kind of faux intimacy, you know, sure. but um, sure. yeah. but nonetheless, like Levi said, you know, I think comparable to his experience, it was it, it, it was still neat and, and, and made for a memorable experience at the show. Yeah. It's a nice uh, gesture. On, yeah. On the part of the bands. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, a couple other times, too, that's happened. Um, first time I saw Kiss, which I also had pretty good seats for that, but they came out on the cherry pickers at the end and this is a kiss show so obviously it's bombastic but you know like i mean when the right the cherry pickers i mean dude like ace and paul are like right in front of me yeah Yeah. it was amazing awesome and then the first time i saw the when i saw the beastie boys in 04 um they came out and did intergalactic out at the soundboard and i was right in front i was i was i was next to the soundboard whoa so it was like Mike D. It was like right there, and I'm like ah, you know, like that as well. <laughs> like yeah, dude, he's like right there. It was a badass. Yeah. Awesome. Plus, that was in '04, so like, you know, I don't have a bunch of pictures of it. You know, I just had sure. to experience yeah. it. Yeah. You know, uh, I had a fantastic. flip phone. I had a flip phone, I think, that took photos, but like nobody was, <laughs> nobody was taking photos there. You know, it was <laughs> all the photos are on the Nokia servers. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that was that I'll was. Awesome. Check U.S. Cellular's records. <laughs> yeah, and that was totally unexpected. Like I kind of knew, I knew that the Stones were going to do that, and mm-hmm. I knew that Kiss would would do the Cherry Pickers, mm-hmm. but like with the Beastie Boys, I just had no idea. So, um, yeah, had, sure. Yeah, it was their first tour in like six or seven years, too. So it was the nice. it was the two the five boroughs. Um, yeah. T- yeah. Nice. Str- strangely nice. enough, too, hardly anybody there at the United Center. Weird. Oh. Yeah. I bought oh. a ticket like the day they went on sale and huh. I show up and the place is half empty. Wow. Yeah. Strange. Huh. I think at that point, you know, like kids weren't into them in 04. No, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just they lost moved on to time. other rap, you know. Yeah. I mean, so it was all, you know, the the, the audience is our age or a little bit older. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, but it was it was yeah. it was dope show. Sure. Nice. All right. Oh, is, it, is it me now? Okay. Yeah, I think we're on to you um, now. Okay. Um, I've got um some of my best ex- concert experiences, and I haven't had a ton of them here, but they've they've all been memorable. I like state fair shows. All right. I like them a lot. Um, obviously, my first kind of one of my first con- con- uh, concert experiences without adults there was Stone Temple Pilots in 1994. Um, I don't count that as my first concert. That was what Levi took me to Marty Stewart. Um, yeah, which was killer. But, you know, his parents were there and everything. The Stone Temple Pilots in 94 was like the first you know, the first, like, kind of, like, concert I really felt like I went to on my own, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I saw Bob Dylan at the fair. That's the first time I ever saw Dylan in 01, and I was really close, you know, which is just, like, just the first time you see Dylan and he's right there. Like, I was probably, shit, I was on the track. I was probably, I was probably 15 feet. He's probably 15 feet in front of me, you know. I mean, Gabe, was, will, will, you, will you explain that the track, the setup at the oh the, yeah the yeah sorry the Illinois State Fair. It's the grandstand is where the um, the big shows are at the State Fair, and it's a horse racing track. Um, that's its its main function, and um, it's got a uh, a bunch of well, they they have bleachers and seats. I don't. I don't know how many. So how there's, many, there's a there's a grandstand. That a grandstand. A, yeah. Right. Holds, yeah. Um, I forget how many thousand people. Um, a few thousand. Oh yeah, it's a few. Because I mean, yeah. it, it was. It's of like the older style to where I mean it. It's big. It it's a big grandstand. It'll hold. I want to say it'll hold like four thousand or five thousand people. Yeah. I, and, yeah. Um, it, it's good sized. Yeah. Like by the time you get a. So then, as Gabe was saying, there's the dirt and the track area in between. The band, the band plays on a stage that is set up basically on what would be the infield of the racetrack. Yeah. And so then the crowd is allowed access to the dirt area of the track to stand. And then there's the grandstand with all the seating behind them. Right. Um, I think, like, max capacity with the full grandstand and a full track is like 11 or 12,000 people. Yeah. So the grandstand might hold more, might hold like 6,000 people. 
I know. I, all I know is our the whole town of Petersburg, Illinois, was at the STP show. <laughs> so there's at yes. least 2,500 there. Oh, there. Um, yeah. But but like you know like like Levi was just describing it. It's also got kind of a makeshift feel to it, you mm-hmm. know, because there is you're sitting you're standing on dirt, you know. Well, it, yeah. It's a the um, original yeah. grandstand. That building I think was built like 1911 or something. Right. So, so yeah, it's, it, it, it's not updated by any no. Means. But it's yeah. I, it's it's totally charming though. I think you're and, reminded that you're at a state fair. Yeah, like there, yeah. there's no losing that fact. When yeah, you're at the show. <laughs> and, and think about this too. You know, a couple other things, right? The tickets are usually cheaper than the rest of the tour dates for the for the band. You know, mm-hmm. um, like it's it's rare that you would see a state fair ticket like over forty or fifty bucks. It seems like, right? You know, even in this day and age, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, food. You know, you got all the good fair food right there. Right. So you don't, you know, like you go to an arena or, you know, a amphitheater, you know, it's like $8 for some shitty soft pretzel, you know. And then, you know, the, the state fair, bam, it's all right there. You know, you can eat right. before you go in. You can usually leave, too, if you want to, if you have to split out for a second and then come back in. You know, they're usually cool with up. that. <laughs> yeah. But like, it's, it's a win-win, man. I don't know, yeah. like... Yeah. I mean, if I lived downstate still, I'd go just, just you know, even if I had marginal interest in the artist, you know? I yeah. mean, yeah. So yeah. I yeah. think state fair shows are winners, man. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right. There's something to be said for that um, setting where you are likely to bump into a lot of people that you know. Yeah. That Otherwise, they're like, whoa, it's weird. I'm seeing that person there at, at, at the show. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, that you would never see at, at, at a show in Chicago or. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. Well, yeah, there's yeah. always it's always a different experience when you're sharing music with people that you know on a level like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. When it's just not you and a couple of friends driving to a out of town to a, a you know what I mean? It's like when you experience music like that with half of your town standing around you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's a definitely a different vibe for sure. That, that STP show was special, you know, for that mm-hmm. reason. It's it's it's. It's still probably one of my favorite concerts, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, plus like the fact that um, the, the I don't know how like the fair booked a national touring act like kind of at the height of its popularity. Yeah. Dude, so they pulled they, one, they pulled a rabbit out of a hat there. I don't know. They had Velvet Revolver when Velvet Revolver was like right brand new. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. True. Yeah. I mean that's I. Yeah, I mean, they, they got them as well, but I mean, just in 94, you know, like when MTV was still like matter oh, yeah. and stuff, you know, I mean, yeah. it, um, yeah, I don't know how the hell they booked, they booked STP, but they glad they did. So, yeah, it was a, um, uh, it was, it was a pretty good set list too. Uh, uh oh, yeah. looking on it, looking at it now, it's it, like you said, it was a purple album. That's, that might be my favorite record of theirs. Um, yeah, probably mine too. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a good show. They they did a Woody Guthrie cover that night, the Gypsy Davy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they did like those cover. couple like they did like those couple like they brought out like that little living room set. They did. Yeah, I remember. I, 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 yeah. I think about that living room set like once a month. I just <laughs> I just envision the living yeah. room set for some yeah. reason. It pops into my mind. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, good stuff, man. Yeah. It's fair shows. I everybody should attend them. And also, I'd like to say that we 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 we're putting we kind of made an outline for it this year, but next year we will do a state fair show. Um, like I I want to Illinois. We aren't going to perform at the state fair. No, we're, we're not. We're not. Show. You know what? We we should broadcast from there. <laughs> Rock you live. I think that would be. I think it'd be kind of cool, actually. <laughs> um, something. It could be about the state about fair. Show. I know. That's what or I'm saying. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. So Ario <laughs> Speedwagon, get ready. All right. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, they haven't announced state fair yet, but they have announced one of the acts at the Sangamon County Fair this year. And that is Nelly. Oh, oh. <laughs> Nelly coming coming to New Berlin, Illinois. <laughs> I um I saw Candlebox at the Sangamon County Fair. Uh, that's nice. that's that's one that's not on my set list. FM roster. <laughs> no, yeah, what? <laughs> Left that one yeah. off. <laughs> yeah, I, me, Gabe and I saw Neil McCoy at the Sangamon County Fair as right. well. Right. Yeah. Hey. But, <laughs> 
you take what you can get at the Sangamon County Fair, people. Well, no, yeah. You, when you're that age and your parents are taking you to shows, you know, fun. Yeah, well, shit. It's going to be Nellyville this year, baby. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well, oh. good stuff. Good stuff. I'm going to go next with mine. And um, I'm going to talk about a little treat that I got in 1991. I don't remember if I got it for my birthday or for Christmas. But that was pretty much the only two times of the year that I ever got video games because, you know, they're $65 for a Nintendo game. And those, those fuckers <laughs> were expensive back then, man. Yeah. They really it's were. It's like video games have always been $65. Yeah, right, like if right. You look at it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I don't get it. Yeah, it's they're, they're expensive as hell. They always have been. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a baseball game, and it was called um, – Roger Clemens MVP baseball. And I don't know if either one of you guys remember playing this game. Oh, I owned it. Like, yes. But yeah, it was um it was quirky. It was a fun game. Let me start off by saying it was a fun game. And it was one of those games where they couldn't get anybody's names, so they have like alternate names for lots of the players. Like on the Oakland team, there are two bashes, and one is supposed to be Conseco, and one is supposed to be McGuire. Get it? The Bash <laughs> Brothers. Right. Yeah. Um, like Daryl Strawberry's name on the game is Raspberry. <laughs> um, Don Mattingly was called Mats. <laughs> they got really inventive with Cal Ripken Jr., and his name was Neckper, which is Ripken spelled backwards. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Ozzy Smith was the wizard. Uh, Ryan Sandberg, his name was called, he, his name was the sharp or the sharp one or something. And uh, was uh, the, the, weird, was... The, the weird thing about this game, though, and why I'm saying it's quirky, was when the, the computer would get a hit, it would then turn to like this weird fielding view. That was totally unlike every baseball game at the time. So it was like you kind of had to learn how to how to field baseball. Total, uh, it was like a, mm-hmm. a totally new way of playing, and um, but it was super fun, and um, it it led me down a, a path of where later I was like, well, there's Cal Ripken Junior baseball. Maybe it'll be good too. Like I figured it was like if. The, if these guys are attaching their names to the games, they must be halfway decent. But no, that's not. <laughs> I don't remember the Cal Ripken one. I mean, I remember the box, yeah. but I don't remember playing it. Yeah, yeah it, it wasn't good either. <laughs> oh. so, so Levi, was was Kevin Bass on the game named like Kevin Catfish or something like that? No, I, I, don't, <laughs> anyway. I don't know. But, but Rob Deere is Bambi on there. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. 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 Um, awesome. Dykstra's Nails. Yeah. Um, Levi, one of my favorite parts of that game, because I was Roger Clemens was my favorite player growing up. And so as soon as that game was released, I got it like I had to have it. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I'll always remember about it is uh, when you steal a base uh, and uh, the catcher throws down and the guys say sliding into second, it goes to this overhead view of you uh sliding into the base and you can choose. Do I want to slide into the right side, the left side or the center? And yeah, that I, way you could evade the tag. Yeah, yeah. I do remember that. that. seems ahead of its time for, oh, like it a, was. for, a, were, for an 8-bit system. of the game, yeah. 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 Like I said, yeah. you just had to get used to the view of when you were fielding. Like, what did you think, Jonathan? Did you think it was kind of cor- like coming from the, you know, like the it, only thing you could compare it to would have maybe been a little bit of bases loaded. But even then, bases loaded, it, it wasn't the same fielding view. It was... I, it, it was different for its time, for sure. Yeah, but it, in, in in a way, it was a bit more natural, I, uh, I think. It, it was just different than everything right. you had played up to that point. But it was right. more natural to like how you would actually play baseball. Exactly. <laughs> and I think part of that was like most games up until that point, you could see the entire field at once. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like a, like RBI baseball, you could see the entire outfield or what, mm-hmm. you know. Whereas this, it was like they were trying to play the angles game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was creative like that. So, nice. yes, Roger yeah, Clemens th- baseball. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. That was a blast from the past. I want to tell everybody, too, one of my favorite episodes we ever done was early in the Chew, uh, in the in the history of Rock and Chew. We, we did a baseball video game episode. I think it's episode 10. 
So go mm-hmm. check that out, everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I promote this episode, I'll I'll post some links to it. I'm, so, I might listen to it again this week. I know we we covered a lot of ground. I mean, we probably even missed a few. You know, like there's Bo sure. Jackson baseball and yeah, but um, but yeah. Anyway, that's one of my favorite episodes we've done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good one. All right. Uh, so I my next one is uh uh. Well, it, it I, I'm going back and forth as to which one to, to choose, but I think I'll go music. And uh, it was Pearl Jam Unplugged, the uh, uh, performance of that on MTV, uh, right. the video specifically, um, uh, the, the video performance uh, in contrast to the the current uh, performance that, that, that came out on vinyl. Um, I shouldn't say the current, but it was reissued on vinyl for right. Record Store Day. Um and uh, I was shut out of obtaining it. I'm, I'm only just, slightly they, annoyed. They announced earlier this week that they've repressed more copies of that. It was available briefly, I think, for like an hour on their website earlier this uh, week. And I don't know if anything more is coming out. Anyway, yeah. that's OK. That's OK. Um, but uh, specifically uh, with uh, Pearl Jam's unplugged performance, it was for me, uh, I think this was recorded in what, 90 late 92 i believe yeah um, the, they were still just touring on i mean they were it was still just 10, just 10. Yeah. just 10 and um it, it was only like a 30 to 40 minute set i think originally it was it was edited down to 30 minutes and uh later you could find a couple extra songs uh that weren't on the original uh, airing and uh but for me it was like this first indication of what live music could be and mm-hmm. like the energy it could create and i was mm-hmm. only because i was only 12 or 13 when i was watching it and when you know i, I would become obsessed with it you know I'd, I'd still have like my vhs home recording of it which mm-hmm. you know was watched dozens of times and we I, think, I, th- I think I guess like, we, we even like had it like we transferred it to an audio cassette too, so oh, like we yeah, can listen to right. it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking a bootleg, you know, like a like as like right. you could you could buy the CD like yeah. as like an unauthorized bootleg. It Rick's. <laughs> yeah, right. Rick, Rick would charge you speaking 60 of 50 bucks, 50 bucks, 60 60 bucks <laughs> for it. Yeah, but like you know, I th- I think like we dubbed it from VHS yeah. to cassette. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and it just sounded probably the into good. the cassette player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, we would have viewing parties. We would take it over to people's houses and watch it, yeah. and right. Right. It, it, it contained a lot. And, and uh, even though it was just a few songs, but I mean, there there's theatrics to it. Uh, um, I mean, subtle theatrics. There's political statements. Um, yeah, and, pro choice on his arm. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, during porch, and, and then that version of yeah. porch is. Uh, Probably one of my all-time favorite versions of any song ever recorded, and uh, and and they were really pushing those acoustic instruments to their limits. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where whereas you know when Nirvana did their unplugged, it was pretty low key. Like they did a lot of slower stuff. Right. Um, but but Pearl Jam didn't. You know they uh, they, they they did a lot of harder stuff uh, for it, and uh, it's it's something that I mean it would it would like make the, the hairs on your neck stand up. And, and, and that was the first time I ever experienced that uh, as a kid, that, that music could, could do that. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's surprising it's this far down in my list. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, think, I think when it comes down to it and I'm looking back on my life, it'll probably be top three mm-hmm. um, most important moments in uh, rock and roll and or baseball for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, gosh, and yeah, gosh, I mean, so many, so many good unplugs, you know. I mean, um, God, MTV used to be so important. Right. So it, important. It, it used to be. Well, and like, I, would would there ever, like, looking back, if we all transport ourselves back to 1998 or whatever, would you ever think there's a time when you're like, damn, man, I really miss MTV or I miss VH1 or like. Like we just, I feel like I totally took it for granted a certain aspect of it all. You know what I mean? Like um, I, I, yeah. I had, I had no inkling that the entire music industry would basically collapse and then had to sure. rebuild itself up out of the ashes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like, 
I I just I wish I don't know. I wish I would have been a lot more head first into certain music and genres back then because now now we don't have access to it. You know what I mean? There's no there's we no have money. access. I mean, yeah. I mean, we can. There's no money to make programs about musicians anymore. You know no, what I mean? No. Mm-hmm. Right. No, we have access to it. I mean, fuck. I can now. I can watch the Hot for Teacher video anytime I want. Exactly. You know? <laughs> right. So yeah. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, there's there's a trade off here, but yeah. No, I mean, there's. It was when it was have, cool. It was cooler yeah. when it had an urgency around it. You know. I mean. Well, and like you, you just brought up kind of a good point about it. Sometimes it's better when people know your tastes and are kind of giving you giving you what you might like to eat whereas nowadays our culture is you can have whatever you want whenever you want gratification yeah and so but it's like walking over to my rack of records and there's two thousand records and it's like there's so many records sometimes i just stare and i'm like what am i gonna play sometimes when you have too many choices it makes it makes the experience not worthwhile anymore. And so Absolutely. I think that part of that was the beauty of VH1 and MTV was, you know, they did kind of know their audience and know what they might like and might not like. Mm-hmm. And it was a, yeah, it was a better yeah. time. I mean, I'm yeah. Not, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I, I agree I just, with you. I can't imagine I there, I would have ever thought I would have taken it for granted. And now I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it, yeah, in hindsight, it's just going to be a blip on the radar, right? I remember the day we got it, man. I mean, maybe I've talked about this on the show before, but like, I remember I came home from Sunday school, and my dad didn't go to church with us, but my mom, my sister, and I did. I came home. This would have been like I think like late '85, maybe early '86 ish. Um. And I came home and my dad's like, hey, we got more channels now, you know, like it got hooked up or something that morning. I don't know why that happened on a Sunday, but anyway. Uh So like, you know, we had Nickelodeon now and we had, you know, TBS and TNT and then we had MTV. And I remember the first video I sat down, so I was kissed, tears are falling, right? Um, So that's from Asylum, which came out in 85. So it would have been right around there. It was a new video and... That's basically where I sat for about, oh, you know, the next 10 years, essentially, <laughs> <laughs> I was watching MTV. I watched the fuck out of it, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you watch it. That, that was how we got music and that's how we got news. You know it was what I mean? It's the best, man. I mean, I, I yeah. want someone to make a comprehensive MTV documentary, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it, like it needs to be like a 10 part thing, mm-hmm. like whether it's. Whether it's, you know, Headbangers Ball, 120 Minutes, even the news. I mean, the news mm-hmm. division was great. Mm-hmm. Tabitha Soren, you know, John Norris. Um, Kurt you know, I don't Kurt think Kent Burns is doing anything. Let's get this motherfucker on it. I know. Yeah. I know. Right. <laughs> yeah. I got excited, man. I like, uh, like, like, I like, like, uh, like John Norris like was joking around with me on uh, on Twitter the other day. <laughs> I was giving him shit about liking the Yankees. Um, so yeah, so your your former MTV News uh, anchors are accessible. Um, but anyway, um, and Tabitha's liked a few of our uh, Instagram posts as well. So, uh, but no, like I mean, the news stuff was important too. I mean, they were doing good stuff. You know, I mean, they were doing. Some some really kind of groundbreaking and like the stuff they did with Rock the Vote, you know. I mean, it was mm-hmm. and like the first the first um, you know, fourteen fifteen years of MTV are that so I think it's some of the most important stuff in pop culture ever. You know, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. good point. Yeah, yeah. So maybe. Is it on anyway, TV? we're we're, we're at an hour now. Okay, all right. If, all right. if you wanted to do another round, we could, but uh, we're at an hour. Uh, yeah, I can. We can do one more round. Let's, let's yeah. since you pointed that out, let's uh, let's okay. bring it home with this one. Um, well, my next one, I can see how this one would be a little bit divisive because some people might think it might be too much, and maybe like Levi was just alluding to, a simpler time was a better time. Um, but. I, you know, I like the fact that when I go to a ballpark now, or most of them at least, there are a wider array of food options than there used to be. You know, like growing up, when you went to a ball game, it was basically a hot dog and Cracker Jacks. Now, you could say, a part of me, again, 
says yes that was better because it was more innocent time and you know you didn't have as many choices etc but um i don't know man when i go to a ball game now at the white Sox park i can pretty much get like any craft beer i want um like you know they've got like you know mexican street food they've got um and granted not all of it's like mind-blowing but they've you know like you can get sushi and you can get you know all this and it's it's overpriced and not as good as it would be in a restaurant but i don't know the fact that there's better ballpark food and beer i think ultimately is is a good thing so i put that one on here but also the sell the sunday helmets still are present so <laughs> you can still get ice cream in a helmet. So they've kept that real. Oh, yeah. So I don't know you guys. Feel, I mean, I don't know. My wife's vegetarian as well. So they've usually got a few things for her. Um, I don't know. Ultimately, I think I think the, the food choices. Um, uh, yeah, I, I that's one part of baseball where, you know, they definitely needed to come into the new age for sure. Right. right you know what right. I mean? Uh, a, a boiled dog with a squirt of mustard and some stale peanuts or whatever yeah right and it seems like i don't i don't know if i'm like it seems like the i haven't ever i've only been to a couple nfl games but it it seems like the baseball has the best food options above some of the other major sports too like when i go to a bulls game for instance or i go to the united center for a concert Mm -hmm. or something like that yeah the, the, the the options aren't that great you know? Yeah, for sure. Coors Field had better food than the Nuggets at the Pepsi Center. Right, right. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like baseball's Base- a little more synonymous with food. Anyway, it, it's it's unique in that baseball's unique in that it affords the fans an opportunity to uh, to go get a snack probably when their team is in the field. When their team's right. on on defense, good point. And yeah. and no other sport can you do that other than maybe football. You know the other team gets the ball, and but you don't know how long that, that could change lasts. quickly. You yes, know, yes. yeah. In right. baseball, you're guaranteed you got at least ten to fifteen minutes before yeah, your right. team is going to bat again. Right. And uh, and so it's it's really unique in that sense. And I I would I would surmise that that's why. Uh, baseball uh, has a lot more cuisine options because people, you know, it's 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 a pastoral game and 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 uh, right. it's a pastoral fan base when when sure. you want to venture out in the in the middle of the fourth inning to uh, and, and you know you're going to be gone for like an inning and a half. It's not just about that half. Oh inning. yeah, right. Yeah. right. And if you got kids, you might not ever be come back to your seat. Oh God, and, yeah. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so it's it's really unique in that sense. And and I'm you're right. I'm I'm glad that it does. Uh, it has expanded uh, like it has. But, yeah, the, the prices are still a little steep, you know. It's... My, well, sure. My, yeah. my only qualm is that it seems like now, though, that if you want something very specific, like at Coors Field, they did have, you know, a vegan hot dog stand. But it, I forgot what level it was on and in which kiosk it was in or whatnot. But it was like you literally had to walk the whole park, basically, to find the one stand that has the thing that you want. Right. Whereas yeah, that, that was the beauty of the old days. It was like every stand's got all four yeah, things that yeah. they sell. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Simpler times, Levi. <laughs> hey, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. <laughs> But no, uh, so so am I next? Uh, yeah. I believe, yeah. I'm going to talk about, um, you know, Jonathan earlier touched on it about how, just talking about how music can make you feel. And um, in 1996, Rage Against the Machine came out with their second album called Evil Empire. And I bought it that day that it came out. I can't remember what it was i guess i could have looked that up i would have had this exact day but um i'll never forget i brought it home and um a friend of mine who lived just kind of down the street he came over and we listened to it and then we had um those uh, little speakers that sony sold that were like really tiny that you could like clip them together and yeah. like plug it into a headphone jack. Right, right. And so we like walked back to his house and like we're still listening to the album and then put it on his CD player. We were listening to it again there. 
and I just I will never forget how pissed off at the world that that album made me in 1996. Like I was ready. I was I, like, give me the Marxist armband. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm going like total socialist. Like let's who was bought and sold. Like I, all of it. I was, I was like, I was in the rage against the machine army, like in awakening the, the the inner <laughs> Eugene Debs inside of Levi. <laughs> right, like I was, I was ready. They they had they were rounding up their soldiers, and I was ready, man. But I just looking back on it now, you know, it's funny, you know, white suburban kids getting pissed off, but it. It's just amazing how music can do that, though. You know what I mean? It, it can transform you from wherever you're at, from a little small town to thinking that, you know, you're the politics of the world and how it's all scams and corrupt and all that or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, they, I think, single-handedly kind of helped open the eyes of a lot of people who might not have ever known about things like that, the things that they were talking about, like pe the people of the sun and, and just, you know, they don't got to burn the books. They just remove them. And it like rage against machine was an introduction to a whole, it got me into reading Kerouac and it got me into just counterculture totally. And I, I, I don't know if I, I would, I, I wouldn't have thought that, you know, when I first was going to get into Rage Against the Machine. I was just trying to get into Rage Against the Machine because they were popular. You know? Rock and roll. <laughs> right? Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of buzz for that second album, I remember, you know, because it was there's about a four year gap between records there, you know, between yep. the first and the second one. Was so that they, really four years? I think the first one came out in late 92. 92. Yeah. Yeah. Do. And then um, and then the, the 96 was Evil Empire. So, yeah, there was. Wow. Well, There's a lot, so a lot like, that happened for the band, you know, between those. And I had kind of missed the first record. Like I had heard Bomb Track, I think, and like I, I just, I just didn't buy it. I didn't own it, and right. so I was like, sure as damn hell, gonna be on this second album. You know what right. I mean? Right. And then once they did, they hyped it out, and then it did, it got released, and Bulls on Parade was a huge single, and. So yeah, I, it just Rage Against the Machine, the Evil Empire. The first record of theirs that I had, like I never bought it in the store, but somehow I ended up with a copy. And I, I kid you not, like I think this thing had like been through like the nuclear holocaust, right? Like, <laughs> like it was scratched up to the max, and like it still played pretty well. That's what I remember <laughs> about the uh, like uh, people had used it for a coaster, you know, like. Oh, it, yeah. And like cigarette burns on the on the on the non music side of it, you know, <laughs> and like yeah, that's that's how I got it, you know, in like a in, in like not the case that it came in either. So <laughs> I had a very, I had a very uh, I don't know, clan a very a very clandestine copy of uh, <laughs> the first Rage record. But that's how powerful the music was, man. That's right. Yeah. That's yep. right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I latched on a Battle for Los Angeles, and it was it was right. It was the Bush Gore election, uh, and they were very uh, they were very visible during that election, uh, I believe. And uh, I remember rocking that to and from my internship while at Iowa State, rocking that to Des Moines and back. And uh, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, like you said, Levi. It was peak counterculture for me. For sure. Um, but it was legit. I mean, there's there's a lot right. of legit. Yeah, it's like there's truth behind it all. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think about it a lot. And, and uh, yeah, it definitely kind of set me on a path uh, after I latched onto it. Yeah, I'm grateful for that. Well, I remember in class drawing the little, like, I, it was, I think, the, like, Abraham Lincoln off the $5 bill. And mm -hmm. underneath it, right, and who was bought and sold and shit, like in my notebooks, <laughs> like, just like the things that they would write or put right. in their little into the liner notes, like <laughs> totally copy those mottos and shit. Nice, nice. I regret not going to uh, that tour they did with Wu Tang. It was like '97 or so. Mm. It was like right around the time I started college. I, I regret not going to that. That would have been killer. 
Yeah, yeah. But they're, they're playing. They've got a few shows on the docket right now, aren't they? Playing some border towns. I don't know. I haven't. I followed. think they are. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think they're playing some like refugee border towns. Seems seems in line with something right. That do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, good one. Um, all right. Well, I guess I'll close it out here uh, with my next, uh, and I'm going to go with the baseball route. And uh, I think my favorite set uh, of baseball cards, and that is 1989 tops. Mm. Um, uh, I know, I know, 87 tops or 86 tops is the most most common for for our generation to cite. But I I like 89 tops. First of all, an affordable 45 cents. Um, uh, but I. I kind of consider it like the most maybe timeless uh set from uh mm -hmm. uh from my heyday collecting days and uh, you know it's just really clean uh with the white edging the swooping team uh and name graphics kind of harken back to the vintage stylings great photography um, in that yeah year too. yeah yeah this this particular oh, yeah. one is is bow uh and uh you had uh can say Oh, Go ahead. I was going to say it was a really good year. The cards don't look washed out that year. No, no, and, no. And right. Certain certain yeah. 80s tops do. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, the there you have Conseco, Sheffield and Jeffrey's future stars. Um, uh, or is the Conseco is not a uh, future star. Just Sheffield yeah. and Jeffrey's are future stars. Right. Um, uh, the Bo Jackson, Jim Abbott, Robin Ventura, Andy Bennis, number one draft pick card. I always think of that one. <laughs> well, and, uh, wasn't the Brighton Jordan 89 tops like a pretty decent card for a little while? The Brian Jordan? Right, yeah. I don't remember that one. I, I mean, I know who you're talking about, but I don't remember the card. Um, uh, the all-star cards were nice. Uh, the updates, too, were nice. Uh, there's a Nolan Ryan when he went from the Astros to the it's Rangers. The Rangers. Yeah. Um, and then I also, uh, I got the Randy Johnson, uh, rookie card of him on, um, on the Expos. Um, right. I got that one. Yep. And, uh, and then I, one thing I noticed is that the, uh, Griffey Jr. and Griffey Sr. poses, uh, for their cards are nearly identical, uh, in that set. Nice. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, the uh, Pearl Jam's primary poster designer, Ames Brothers, did a uh, did, did a uh, uh, a show poster uh, that mimics this '89 Tops design. Nice. So, nice. Yeah. I had some '89 Tops folders back then. Oh yeah. In yeah. school. Do you remember who you had? <laughs> you I want to like, say Dawson? I might have. I might have had Dawson or Sandberg or Grace. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, now the, the Grace eight, card, he's got eight, his back to the camera, kind of. He's like, kind of like looking over oh, yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The the Sandberg card is like kind of a side shot of Sandberg as well. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's a nice set. I I should probably just go ahead and collect it. I should start collecting it now, putting it together, piecing it together. Oh, the whole year? Yeah. 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 yeah just get it. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, that that Jeffries card is that, that's the first card I think of when I think of eighty nine. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. and the like Sheffield, if, the Sheffield Future Star is a pretty iconic card too. Yeah, right. Dude's got braces. Yep. Yeah, he's got braces on. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then I remember I had the Sandy Alomar. It was a pretty popular card too. The mm, Future right. Star. Got the big it, catcher's mitt. Yeah. It's like yeah. literally the ball just went into the mitt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It looks yeah. like it's it could fall out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. Beautiful, beautiful set. Yeah. I, I agree with you. 87, 89, like, I, um, that's definitely one and two. But you kind of have to ask me, you know, some days I might tell you 87's my favorite. Other days sure. I might tell you 89. <laughs> am I, I an 87 80, I, game today or am I an 89 game I think today? 89 has better photography. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah. Everybody's just a sucker for that wood paneling, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's pure nostalgia. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's worth it. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody for spending some time with us. It was good to be back, and I promise we will not have as big of a of a gap between episodes. Um, looking forward to more episodes in 2020, and uh, and rounding out our list of gratitude as well. I think um, we're down to about 60, 64 <laughs> right, now. 64. Right, so we, we, we might finish this in 2020, maybe. 
Um, um, but anyway, um, like to thank Jonathan and Levi. Like to thank um, everybody who's listened before to the show. And if you're a new listener, please like us on Facebook, like us on Inst- follow us on Instagram or Twitter. You can follow us at Rock In Chew. That's in as in Nomar is Ramon spelled backwards. I just thought about that the other day. <laughs> it's true. Um, right, and there've both been some good was, ball, was ball, that ball players of those things. Was that was that always the story that Ramon was his dad's name, and so they named him Nomar? I don't know. I don't know. I, uh, the White Sox sign, uh, what's his name the other day from Texas? Nomar. Oh, right. Yeah. And then yeah, somebody I'm like sorry. on Twitter was like, hey, do you know that's Ramon spelled backwards? I'm yeah, like, oh, I, shit, it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I forget that there's Nomars other than Garcia Parra. Right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, follow us on there, uh, Rock In Chew. Um, and then also you can find all episodes of Rock and Roll Shinsu Chew at Rock chew.com you can find us on youtube or your favorite podcast app tell all your friends please and we look forward to getting you some more content in the upcoming new year hope everybody has a safe holiday season and until next time take care good night peace